what's good, y'all, and welcome my oh, I'm just say it's to my review of the first episode of Hiroaka Season 7. Ladies and gentlemen, man, oh, does it feel good to say that again, man. You guys know it's been a minute since Hiroaka Season 6 wrapped up. And it's sad. It feels good to be back, man. You know, Fang's doing his threads. I don't think he's posted his, like, main thread of the episode uh, just yet. But, um, yeah, the episode was fantastic. You guys uh, you guys know I'm, I'm releasing this video a little bit later than that usually was. I posted up the reaction first because, as you guys may know, today was Backlash. And because of that, and so I ended up being, because it aired, like, 10 a.m. for uh, my time, I ended up just, well, I'm, I managed to wake up early enough to, like, where I can watch the episode, at least, so I wouldn't have to worry about spoilers on Twitter, get the reaction up for you guys while I was watching the show, and the show itself was fantastic, I love it, Backlash was a fantastic uh, pay-per-view today. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, finally gonna get through this, man, I don't know, and you guys also know today is Star Wars Day, a fitting day for Hero Walk to make its return, man. I don't know if I'll be able to make time to watch The Last Jedi after I'm done recording this or not, because I also gotta finish up Knuckles, so I might push Knuckles back to went to, to Sunday, and then just, you know, do Saturday to where I can finish up and watch The Last Jedi again, because it's Star Wars Day, man. But anyway, I'm rambling on. The episode itself, man, was fucking brilliant, man. A fantastic episode, man. Uh, really well anime, I have to say. There was some really good animation in this episode as well. And we'll obviously got the, we'll talk about the OPs and the EDs when we get there, man. We'll do a slight little analysis on them and sort of like give my uh, thoughts on them and the look of them as well as we get to those parts of the episode, man. I also love the look of the new ex uh, next episode preview thing they have there for the title card. They now went with this more turquoise kind of color. I really dig it, man. I really dig it. Also, guys, one other thing you guys may have noticed, uh, new footage. So, yeah, you guys know for Season 6, I was using All One Justice 2 footage. Now I'm using Ultra Rumble. You guys know the game has come out, and you guys have been playing it like crazy, man. I literally have already dumped over 100 hours into the game, in which I never do for multiplayer games. So, it's kind of just Ultra Rumble's kept my attention for that moment. But it's a genuinely fantastic game, and I'm loving it. So, yeah, that's what you guys are seeing footage of. Some of this will be footage you guys have already seen from the, uh, just from the Ultra Rumble videos I've already posted. But some of it is just footage I've had that I download whenever I have a decent somewhat decent game or whatnot or you know something crazy happened man i record foot so yeah you guys are gonna be getting that now and uh hopefully you guys enjoy the new footage so uh anyway let's just jump right to the actual review so we start the episode off with my boy doing his laundry yes my boy is finally doing his fucking laundry <laughs> and actually the second the first thing Isaac says in the episode once he like you know steps outside and you know gets his laundry out there he says like i can't remember the last time i washed my clothes <laughs> and i'm like bruh Bruh, my dog, how long were you out there again when you were with, with, with the black, with the dark hero arc, man, bro? How long were you out there again? <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, we got the flashbacks to, of course, Uraraka's speech, man, which... Ugh, peak, man. That, 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 you guys know, if you guys remember watching my reaction to that episode, man, it was, I was legit tearing up when I watched that episode uh, in the original Japanese, man. But also, of course, you know, Lucy did an incredible job as well for that sequence. We then get another flashback to when, uh, after once he puts on one's uh, Grand Trio's cape up, we get flashback to when he's when Grand Trio handed him his cape. Although it looks like we also get like an extra uh, alternate angle that I'm pretty sure was not in the original episode uh, when this uh, of this scene. I don't think it was. It might have been. I'm, I'm just forgetting. But I'm pretty sure this is a, this was a new uh, uh, angle we got of it. We have one more flashback to when Izuku was a kid. You know, saying like I want, but I want to save that boy, which. Bro, man, which I gotta say, man, I cannot wait for Izuku and Shigaraki's rematch, man. We kind of see little teases of that in the ED with Mount Fuji, and I have seen some manga pals from some of the more recent chapters of their new, of their, I guess, more, their recent rematch. I think it's like all oh, one continuous fight that's been split off across God knows how many chapters of the manga, and I'm excited, man. There's been a lot of cool shit. From a little bit to I see, man, oh, that fight is going to be legendary. So anyway, it takes the elevator down to the, I think, the ground floor of the of the dorms, I think. I'm not entirely sure what the exact layout of this place is. Um, and he's met with the boys. Udaraka's waving at him, man. You'd love to see it. You'd love to see it. And then we see Bakugo and the others, man. And that is when we get to the OP. And the OP is fucking brilliant, man. This is definitely one of my favorite OPs of the season. I don't know if I would go as far as say it's my absolute favorite. It's definitely like a top three if it is not met. First of all, TK does a song, man, and once again, he don't miss. It's, it's, this song was an absolute banger, man. You guys know his work from TG, 91 Days, etc., etc., etc. So when it was announced that he was going to be doing the song for this episode, I knew this, this song was going to be a banger. Now, as some of you guys may know, this OP did actually uh, leak a few, like a week or two ago. Um, obviously, super a lot more like the parts of the first episode. There were the, you know, there was these super low red screenshots floating around Twitter, which I would avoid, like the absolute plague. Although the full song also ended up leaking as well. 
I don't know how people are getting this shit, man, but whatever. <laughs> how the how people are getting this, how, how are they getting this, getting this stuff, but regardless such, man, I did listen to the full track uh, when the, when I did see it leaked in there, and the song, the full song, so sounds brilliant, man, but yeah, the song itself, but yeah, the song is brilliant, and the visuals, man, the visuals in this OP, man, were also, were also spectacular. First of all, I gotta say, I love the use of colors in this OP, which... Shout out to my man Fang. He mentioned this on his Twitter thread. That dude, he mentioned uh, an anime by the name of Tomo uh, Tomo Hasa Taguchi, if I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, Keen Ai Yutsuko. So I'm not sure exactly what role he was. It doesn't seem like I think he might have just been like a key animator, or maybe he was like an assistant director or something. I'm not entirely sure what his role exactly in his OP was, but the man knows how to knows his colors, man. Because there's so many great shots of use and color in here, man. Especially with like the backgrounds in here, man. Like we got like these real, like we got this one shot of Mei Hatsumi with some other kids working on something in light smirk on something I, I i i have a feeling i know what it is but i'm not gonna say for spoilers uh for any you know manga reader for any mls that it doesn't know that has been that hasn't seen what that has, doesn't see little beats of what's happening in the manga currently but i think i know what she's working on man but i'm not entirely sure we get this really nice shot of also shin so we finally get to see what it's full uh hero costume looks like which i've already kind of seen from some fan art of man along with um Mono, which I'm curious to see what he's going to be doing this season, man. I saw a panel with uh, Austin Tindall, and he mentioned, like, oh, with Mono must big moments coming out in the next season. So, okay, that's cool. But really, some of the more imp really impressive moments was one where we see um, the good doctor with a bunch of his gnomus, man. You have, like, these different color, uh, like, tubes that are different colors. It reminded me a lot of... <laughs> And I'm sorry I'm making this reference, but uh, Metaphor, the, you know, the, the, the faction in NXT currently, man, they have a similar entrance where they have, like, different colors for each of them right before they make their entrance, man. It reminded me a lot of that. We also have this one with uh, Ryukyu that looked really good, a shot with Endeavor, with, like, a red on there, with Mirio, uh, Tamaki, and Hawks, and Miracle Men that looked really fucking nice, as well as Neji Ray rocking short hair, which... I'm a be real man. I'm not really too fond of it. You know, it's kind of weird with me again. Because some of you guys may know, I might have mentioned this uh, in previous videos. Maybe not so much here at Waka, but like, usually with me, whenever there's a character that starts with like long hair and then goes to short hair, I usually always prefer like, you know, Videl, uh, Carol Danvers. Uh, I think there's another one that I. Uh, Sakura. Yes, yeah, I like her more with the short hair rather than long hair. Usually has it, but like, both with Neji Ray as well as Horikita. Uh, for Clash of the Elite, man, when they went to short hair, man, I lie, man, I don't really, I don't really vibe with it that much. I kind of much prefer them a long hair, man. Uh, now, to be fair, once I actually saw the context behind the Clash from the Elite one and about Horikita's backstory and everything, man, once we got to that episode season three, man, I did like it a lot more. It has slowly been growing on me, but I definitely prefer her with long hair, man. Nedure, man, I don't know, man. I, I'm not really, really vibing with it currently right now. Uh, we also got some really nice shots of Todoroki and Dobby, but it's the one cool thing about the Dobby one is that you can actually see, like, in the reflection of, like, a mirror, you can actually see Toya in there as well, which I thought was a really nice touch, man. I really like that shot. Another highlight of the OP mirror that we get to see, we actually get to see a, a, a brief glimpse. There's also some really nice shots uh, with uh, with both Ayazawa with Kurogiri as well as uh, Spinner with uh, with um, Skeptic, which I'm really curious to see what they're going to do now with Spinner and uh Skeptic, man. I'm curious to see what they're what they're exactly their plans are going to be doing, man. But one of the highlights we get to see, we actually finally got to see a brief a brief look at Toru's face. We got to see her final form, her actual form in the anime for once, which I appreciate the first time we've ever actually seen this in the anime. Now, I'm sure most of us, if you guys are Hero Walker fans, have probably already seen what Toru actually looks like, man. Either from the countless amounts of fan art I've seen uh, over the last couple of years, or if you were there and you saw that infamous cover page that that for a chapter of Hero Walker, we actually got to see basically Toru completely visible, and there was like these like caution tape like all around her body, and we found out she's actually quite thick, man. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, she said to my God, why have you been hiding from me, bro? I'm not, you know, I'm not, if I knew this what you look like, man, I might have, I might have been singing a different tune about Toru, man. I mean, she has voiced my girl Felicia on channel, man. You guys know I'm a big fan of her wick. If I know this is what you look like too, I mean, she might be hot off my rockets, man. I'm not saying. <laughs> but anyway, and if you guys saw that, man, you know every you know that got a bunch of people's. And twist man to call in Horta Coach Sensei a fucking pedophile, which 
touch some fucking grass and get off Twitter, you fucking weirdos. Anyway, minus minus tangent about that whole thing. That was a that was a complete shit show when that happened, man. Regardless, man, we also got that. We get some really nice slow mo shots of Uraraka and Toga, which I'm super excited for their fight. For their fight, uh, we see Bakugo repping the fucking Arsenal like he's War Machine, which I'm really excited about that one, man. What that? Because I've seen fan art of that, but I didn't know if it was like a legit thing that he actually came out dressed as War Machine. But I guess it was a legit thing. He does come out dressed as War Machine. But then we get this really nice cut of Izuku just rushing around there, which seems to actually been a mixture of 2D animation along with 3D backgrounds of Izuku just like flying and jumping around and with him like high fiving some of his classmates. You see him high fiving Saro. He also does it with Uraraka. Bakugo makes an appearance in the last segment, which looked really cool, man. And yeah, we in the, in the final shots, and we also get like a quick, a quick glimpse of Izuku ba and um, Shigaraki charging. We also get another really cool shot of, Sh of Shigaraki where we see a bunch of all for ones like hands. It looks like man close in on them, and you can see like uh, Tenko Shimura inside, which I'm really, which I'm like, which I'm like, so I mentioned, I'm really excited for that fight. Love with Toga and Uraraki, which I'm pretty sure we will begin that. Uh, this season, man. Well, just because I've heard a lot of great. It's, I know that fight's kind of apparently been a bit mixed reaction. Some people love it, some people hate it. I'm just excited to see how what Lucy and, and uh, Leanne's performances are going to be for that fight when we actually get there, man. But yeah, once again, like I said, that cup with Izuku rushing through the rushing through the city, man, and like the, like you know like high fiving some of his classmates, man, was really open. that's probably my favorite moment in the opening. Let's look at this really clean shot of uh, of of Mirko uh, now with her like with with her mech arm and. Yo, prosthetic leg, which I don't remember her losing a leg in season six, but I could be wrong on that one, man. Um, yo, overlook b b behind the moonlight, man. That shot looked really good. There was a lot of amazing shots this entire like Overall, man, this was a, an amazing OPI. Definitely one of the best of the season, man. Like, I, there, I don't, I don't really like how visually unique and comic booky the first season six OP was, but this one, man, has some amazing visuals as well, man. They're both incredible OPs. So yeah. And then we actually move over to Star and Stripes, uh, which apparently I did not know this at first. Apparently, uh, in Birmingham, in uh, Bright Bright Brightman, if I'm saying that right, I'm not sure where exactly what city this is supposed to be. Apparently, all of this was anime original content, and none of this was in the manga. Apparently, from what I've heard, man, I saw some tweet mentioned that that that, that Bones added that this was, that it was anime original content, and it wasn't actually in the manga. Which it's always cool when Bones adds uh, adds new content to fill in the blanks in there that were there, to fill in the blanks that were there in the manga. And then we see a few of these airmen watching uh, watching it like one of the. Um, Hangers uh, watching the TV as we see someone on the news. It's basically a recap what happened in season six. They're like, oh, you know, Shigaraki and All for One broke out, and blah, 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 blah. Villains are at large wreaking havoc. We're using a lot of shots from season six, which <laughs> I do find it kind of funny that, you know, this whole thing is supposed to take place in America and everything, yet everyone is still speaking Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> just found that a little funny but anyway eventually the, the reporter gets met up with these two mad mac these two mad max wannabes and they're like hey man what are you doing here and then like one of the walks in like a side headlock the other guy like takes down the camera so god knows what happened to that dude they're wondering like if anything has happened have we gotten the green light yet and they haven't the white house doesn't know uh, what to take and then of course star and stripe shows up and she's like all right fuck it then we'll go by ourselves Got it. so pretty sure they just reused the footage that we saw for from season six right here real quick before we head over back to all for one hiding in like his in his cave that he's been uh, hunkered out in recently which at first i thought they were gonna reuse some of the footage that we saw in the memories um recap episodes but no this is the but no i'm pretty sure maybe the opening shot was probably reused from that from that episode but, but all this was new so we see all for one he's talking to spinner mentioning that mentioning that the that the, that the chaos has been going on with the criminal with 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 all with the breakout and with the breakout happening and all of them running him up has given the perfect strategy to keep the to keep the short staff police and heroes busy to keep them from focusing on them He's talking to Spinner Man. Spinner tells him, like, hey, bro, you know, we could have just won if we just left the country. And, you know, all for one, man. This dude is like fucking Aizen. I swear to God, man. This man has, like, ten different plans. He's like, yes, yes, this is all a part of my plan. He mentions that he wants to see it's all for one, one for all. And that is the mid-game goal. And Spinner's like, ain't that the end-game goal? It says they planned ahead for a very long life and that he al has allies all over the world. And this was a really nice shot we also got as well as all for one guy puts his hands up there with like the glow behind him man before he fades up man. That shot looked really good too. The storyboard in this episode was really good. Along with the OPs, Mr. Man. The storyboard in that, in that OP and the little 80 man were both fantastic. 
So imagine that that even though that that organized crime has more or less been eradicated in Japan due to, of course, All Might, it's not the same with the rest of the world because he has allies all over the place. He's gonna have them, yo, know, wreak havoc in their own in their countries and everything, man, to keep those heroes from those alternate countries busy on their own problems before, so they can't go out there and help Japan with their issues, man. Which pretty much. Then we also get like a nice shot of New York City. With, at least, I, I assume it's New York City, because we see the Statue of Liberty, so I don't know where else it could be other than New York, but, or maybe more, because, like, uh, important American landmarks, New Statue of Liberty, <laughs> there we go, we'll go with that. <laughs> no idea if, if Stars and Trides even came from New York, as well, or anything, man, as, like, you know, as a most Marvel heroes do. But anyway, we get a Statue of Liberty, which was actually a CGI model, I thought this was, like, hand-drawn at first, but... Upon, but then I saw a tweet about this, and upon closer, but yeah, it is definitely a CGI. But the CGI looks really good, man. I really like the CGI. Like I, said, I mentioned this with time. Bones is a very good CGI team. Like, I think out of all the major studios, studios out there, man, Bones probably has the best CGI team, man, in my personal opinion, man. So it continues on. We're mentioning how, you know, like, unlike, unlike, you know, and unlike Dobby, or yes, he calls him Toya here. And so the other man, he's actually, you know, stayed there, stayed at the base, stayed at the cave, and protected all for one, but tells him that he, that it's time for him to convince his mission. And then we cut over to a bunch of randos finding this, finding this, like, paper on the wall says Spinner is our voice. And we find out that these randos are actually part of Spinner's group, that he, with the group he was assigned by, um, Skeptic or whatever they, like, whenever the Paranormal Liberation Front, or whatever the Liberation Front, and the League of Villains combined into one and became the Paranormal Liberation Front, if I got my details right. And, like, each one of them gave, was given their own separate dex, dis, uh, guys that they were in command of in their own little teams. This is Spinner's team. And so we find a bunch of them, like, I remember all of you guys look like just random, no side characters, like, none of them really have any striking designs, if I'm being real, which I think might have been the point. So, we then also get over to Skeptic, where he's in front of the computers, telling everyone that they need to work together with with Spinner to, of course, you know, fulfill their mission. We then see, we then get a shot of, of Toga, where then once again there's these, like, signs placed around the wall saying the tragedy of Himiko Toga is not over. We get a quick shot of Dobby as well. We get a really clean shot of Steve, of, Do of Toy, of uh, Spinner turning into, turning into, uh, turning into Sting, as, as Skeptic says, that it doesn't matter whether or not they're actually liberators, we will make, we will, we will sow the seeds to win, we will make them, we will make them true liberators, which I thought was really nice shot. We then went back to Best Genius and Best Genius Hawks and Hawks inside the Batmobile, where they actually have like this little thing on their phone that tells them that, that, that tells them that Star and Stripe is heading into their airspace, and of course they get a word that of course she's a rocket is there to meet, and then we get this really clean shot. Pretty sure all of this was CGI, but regardless it looked amazing, where Got it. The camera fast, like, rushes past uh, Endeavor and goes up before, like, goes up through the clouds, man. And, like, you kind of get a nice above shot above the clouds before they switch over back to, or before we switch over back with to, with Shigaraki and Star Trek. This shot was a really cool, man. This shot was a really nice shot, man. And then, like, we also, and also, guys, I love this shot where we see, where we just kind of see, just sh see Shigaraki's hand, but then in the foreground we see Stars and Stripes, man, and with her, like, with her, like, team of, like, uh, air, airplane of planes and everything. Like, that show looked really cool, man. But although, Jesus Christ, man, I've you guys know that like with this is like another small town going real quick. You guys know that like people love to. You guys remember back in season four when everyone was bitching about the manga panel thing and they were constantly comparing manga panels to the anime for like, oh my god, they ruined this shot, man. And then sometimes it would literally be the exact same fucking shot. And I'm like, what are you bitching about? This one, I saw people saying like, oh my god, Bones ruins this shot, man. And I looked and they would show you the manga version. It's literally the exact same fucking frame, just with added clouds. <laughs> it's like, what is wrong with you people, man? Jesus Christ. So anyway, we finally have their, we finally have them, which I, which I also don't know if I mentioned this before, but I, if I mentioned this when I was watching, uh, while I was reviewing season six when she made her initial appearance there, uh, but if you guys did not know, uh, Star and Stripes is actually voiced by Rumi Park in the Japanese, who you guys may know is the voice of Edward Elric as well as Magman, the goat, Goshiro. As, and of course, the dub she's voiced by now, who you guys may know as the voice of her, which I'm excited to see what her performance is going to sound like once we get into season 7, because now she'll have to get like real screen time with her, man. I'm excited to see what Natalie's going to do with her, man, and what her performance is going to be during this fight. So, stars and still star and strike that star asks well, who this guy is, and she thinks at first that's all for one, which obviously we know it's actually Shigaraki, which of course one of her guys tells her that Shigaraki, and and that from our and, and from our intel we know he, he, that everything he touches will decay, that, he that his fingers touch will decay and crumble. So then they all take their formation, which I do wonder that given you know like all like they were on an air force base, and like now if you guys did not know, there's actually legitimately a super a hero 
from, I want to say, the 80s from DC actually called Stars and Stripes, which I think Orko took some inspiration from. I do wonder, given the fact that they're on that they were on an Air Force base, you know, what a Star and Stripe looked right before she went into her hero suit, of course, you know, that she's with there with a bunch of, like, uh, these massive jets or whatever, man. I do wonder if he did take some cues from Carol Danvers when he was creating Star and Stripes, besides stealing the name from an actual DC hero, man. I do wonder if he, like, mixed it some of Carol Danvers again, just with all the Air Force uh, motifs and, the, and, she's, and, and being there with the military. I do wonder if she took some cues from, uh, he took some cues from uh, Carol Danvers. Anyway, once they all take their formation, she meant, she says, you have my word that I will deliver your remains to your families. Now, I don't know if she's talking to Shigaraki when she says it, man, or if she's talking to her fellow, to her, like, com to her comrades in case any of them die. I, I don't know who she was talking about from there. And then we get this amazing shot of Shigaraki's eye, which looked very reminiscent to, if you guys remember back in season four, when Isaac was fighting off against Overhaul uh, during uh, Nakamura's cut, there was that really close-up shot on Shigaraki, on one on 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 overhaul's eye right before Izuku delivered his divine justice man that shot was insane man so i do i don't know if nakamura himself worked on this episode man or someone else did there that just looked really that just took a lot of inspiration from that from that one shot but it was very reminiscent of that shot and the detail on this shot is insane man it was amazing it was an incredible shot anyway um, so he meant, so then he, so then Shigaraki meant, like, I am certain that I am sure Tomo, uh, Tomo Shigaraki, but I have no doubt that, I, that this is also me, of course, all referring to all for one, you know, Shiga all for one, they're still very much entwined with one another, man, they still are very much still merged, although they don't have their voices overlapping each other like they did during season six. So Shigaraki unleashes radio wave plus air cannon plus heavy payload. Don't even know what heavy payload even is, but what? I, but okay. Fires off this, fire those off this, a massive attack of both, and the effects work here looks really good. So then she lands, but she lands to land back on her on one of the jets, as Shigaraki says, I know what your quirk is, let's see who tags the other first, American lady. <laughs> Which kind of crap me up here, I'm saying, American, here's Shigaraki saying, he's saying, American. I don't know if he's throwing the lady part in there, maybe he did in the Japanese, but all the only thing I heard was American. Anyway, so then Star, Star, Star says despite that I remain def undefeated despite showing up by Trump Court. That's why I'm the strongest boy. So yeah, if you ever wanted to hear Edward say boy, there you go. <laughs> and, th and then we see, and then we finally get to see Star, Star's quirk. And I gotta say, bro, she gotta be having one of the most OP quirks I've seen in the entire series, man. Like, this quirk is absolutely insane. She yells out air, and, and while she has like her hands up in, t uh, hands up in the air, uh, hand, uh, hands up in the air, and says, from now on, air does not exist within the space of one, space 100 meters, which once again, you're supposed to be American, why are you using, you the metric system. I don't know, do military do military people use the metric system in America, or is that or or do they actually switch that one for the military? Not sure. Regardless of such, man. Just 100 meters in front of me, and then throws the, and then throws it at Shigaraki in like this star-shaped barrier on, around Shigaraki. Now, of course, because she says that there's no air resistance, air, Shigaraki cannot breathe. So he starts falling, and then we get, and then of course President Mike does the whole thing like, but say Star and Strive, her quirk, her quirk, new order, new, 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 new world, new world order. Bow, 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 bow. <laughs> I had to throw the little NW, NWO reference. Which actually the cool thing about this one, man, I'm pretty sure this is the first time we've ever uh, seen this one for a quirk explanation. Where they actually switched up the barrier, uh, they had like a border around the screen with like, a, with obviously like a, you know, red, white, and blue, very American thing. As President Mai was explaining her quirk, she can, that after attacking the target and announcing their name, she can, she can set new rules on that target. She touched the air and set a new rule that negates the existence of air, creating a vacuum space, which of course we saw her in case Shikaraki and says, see him as we see him slowly fall into his as soon as we see him falling down and of course she was like that's such a that's such a crazy quirk i want it because of course like, like i said bro this is a super op quirk so then a bunch of ships a bunch of ships, a ships circle around circle around the uh star shape vacuum and fire off the fire off lasers at it which shigaraki of course which shigaraki reflects back at them and of course all the man to dodge it uh, man, they well at first they think they they finally beat Shigaraki with those lasers, which we know was not going to be the case. And then he uses reflect plus scatter to throw throw, throw to throw the lasers back at at the um, at the jets at the air force and stars. But but she manages to catch it once again, saying laser is mine to wield. Then of course they see Shigaraki's body. They find that Shigaraki's body can regenerate. Like that's why Japan laws. Like yeah, no shit. So then they're like, oh, so then they decide to fight. Then they, like, and I, one thing I felt kind of surprised is that, like, neither one of these two can fly. At least I don't think. I think Shigaraki might be able to fly, but Star Destroyer can't, which I thought she could because she had this massive cape on her and everything. I thought she could fly, but I guess she can't. Where 
They decide to have an airborne they have an airborne fight based on based on strength, and that's just how she wants. So they so they like both like charge right each other. This all look this was all pretty cool. They charge right towards each other, but of course Stars managed to get the punch in there and send Sugar Rocky flying back as she once again lands lands land, lands nicely on one of the jets once again. And then we find out her orbs, man, and this was honestly insane. You guys of course saw some of my reaction to the episode that this that this shocked me. We found out that the little girl that All Might saved at the start of Two Heroes was actually Stars and Stripes. Which is kind of insane to think about, man. And I think that basically confirms that without doubt Two Heroes is like the most canon of all of all the movies, man. Because as some of you guys probably know, that it's that the movies are indeed canon. But are they canon canon? You know, we can debate on whether or not they are truly canon canon to the main, you know, manga series. I think we can all agree by this point that Two Heroes is without a doubt, you know, canon canon to the manga series. Because not only do we have Melissa's arm gone, let's make an appearance during season six, and I guess also season seven as well, with Izuku, what he's wearing, but also we also found that the little girl that got saved was Stars and Stride Man, so yeah. I think I've always. I think we can agree that that two heroes is the most is without a doubt the most canon out of all of the films, man. Which is kind of insane to find that that was Stars and Stripe, a young Star and Stripe, uh, watching that we saw back in Two Heroes, man. It's kind of insane, man. I I, I wonder if this was shown off in the manga version because obviously for the end they just showed you the footage of from Two Heroes. But I'm curious to know what this looked like for the manga version as well. Uh, but yeah, that was pretty insane. I mentioned that he became a mentor in her mind, and as a show of my even greater dedication to bringing peace, I have eight antennas of meaning, because of course, you know, all my has two antennas in the front of his hair. You know, now she has eight man, which of course, with her hair being super spiky. So then she manages to land, so then she lands, oh, so then she lands, or the, actually two of the jets sandwich Shigaraki between them. Stars and, uh, Star lands on top of them, and Sugar is like, oh, all you people talk about is all night. And then she says, it's the very reason he's titled the symbol of peace. And then she tells him, and then she tells him that he tagged him, that she tagged him in the last attack. And then she says, Tom, if Tomura Shigaraki moves even an inch, his heart will stop beating. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Star and Stripe is a make is also a makeshift death note. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, man, this woman, like, this woman's cork is so mean, man. I am genuinely curious, though, if this chick ever gets added to one to Ultra Rumble, if it ever, if the game is survives long enough to get to finally start to get to new characters they haven't been, to, they weren't in One Justice 2, like Mirko, and of course, Stars and Strides, maybe the movie villains as well. I'm curious how they would balance this chick out, how they would balance this chick, because I'm very curious of what they would do, what her moveset would look like, man. Also, to see the key animation when she says, his heart will stop being, man, fantastic work, fantastic work. So, and of course, Shigaraki is shocked by this. I'm shocked by this. Everyone is shocked by this. So then we go back. So then Shigar all for one takes over as we head back into like the astral plane or whatever, or wherever the spiritual realm is, uh, where we once again see Shigaraki and all for one merging into one another. And all for one, man, he's loving this. like, yes, yes, you have grown far beyond the, what the doctor and I have anticipated. Yo, yes, give me more rage. Be, give me more anger and all that. So then Shigaraki starts moving. And his heart doesn't stop beating. Then we kind of figure out, and then from, and also Shigaraki's hair starts growing like crazy. I don't know how this, ha I don't know how that even remotely works. But regardless, Shigaraki says those tiny bits of hatred keep piling up. Sets off a massive attack that sends, when it says start, that sets stars right back to one of the air, to one back to one of the jets. And then we kind of get a better idea of how exactly her quirk works exactly and we're, we find out that, she, that her that basically everything about her quirk has already been made uh, made publicly has already been documented and made publicly and so that's why they, we already know how that all that works which makes sense because of course how op it is and he even meant like it's as unpredictable as child's play which that's literally what it, it's just making a bullshit it's like literally random bullshit go <laughs> that's literally what it is and so we find out more and then she kind of explains or like or at least he hypothesized how her quirk actually works, and more or less how it seems to work is that it, that that like oh, yeah, some it was I'm not completely certain that I know how it completely works, um, but more or less with the whole Sorry. thing about the identity thing and how Shigaraki's heart is still very much and how Shigaraki's still very much like it has to be that what her version of the character of the person she's pointing or, or targeting's identity is has to be the same sense has to be the same identity or sense of identity as the person she's targeting. So because Shigaraki has like three different personalities inside of it, and of course his name isn't actually Tomura Shigaraki, it is Tenko it is Tenko Sh uh, Sh uh, Shima. 
or Sh- Sh- uh, Shima, if I, think, I believe so, if I'm saying that right. Um, that because, of course, he's like Mercurly, Mer- or, yeah, Tenko Shimura, excuse me. Um, that whether or not it's Shigaraki, it's all for one, Shiga all for one, or or, t- or Tenko Shimura, Shimura, that's why, and because he isn't completely certain on which identity he is, then to make, then, you know, her quirk isn't going to work on That seems to be the basic gist on how her quirk works, seemingly. There's a much more bigger ex- explanation the episode gives into that I'm, I'm, I'm still not completely certain about. At least for that part, I think that's how exactly her quirk works. I assume so. I might be wrong on that one. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, guys. Or if you guys can uh, further, you know, um, can further elaborate on it, man, please do so in the uh, uh, please do so uh, in the comments. And then while he's and while the whole thing's going on, he's, he just goes on a tangent about his dog, his old dog that he killed. Where he says, "Well, the quirk work of my dog, my my dog mom, if she called its name." <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of random, and Sugar Rocky's like wondering, like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> and now he wants, and he wants to test his hypothesis. And, and now he can't resist the urge to test his hypothesis. We have back over to Star. We have back to Stars and Stripes, and she's prepping for Sugar Rocky's next attack. And then we, and then she, <laughs> and then her next attack, man. Which I don't know about y'all, but did anyone else? Did anyone else feel like this remind remind them a lot of Kamamura's Bonkai? Like with the whole thing, how it worked, man. It reminded me. Of, I don't know if he did take cues from Kamamura. Bon Kai man. We know that you uh, teach that um uh Horiko Sensei does t- does take it does, has taken some inspiration for Bleach uh for Hirawaka man. So I do wonder if he took this from a uh, couple more bottom. But what he, but anyway, she's can she then grabs onto the air again and says, Condense into my shape that's one that's one thousand times bigger. Fist bump of the earth as we see the air itself merge into like a form of her. Which the animation on this looked really good too. So it forms, she says, fist bump there, and like we see her actually like moving with it. This is why I think this is why I say it reminds me a lot of Kamamura's Bankai, because Kamamura's Bankai worked in a very similar fashion, having this giant, you know, this like giant creature there that you can basically control at will, man. It, like, that's, like, this reminds me a lot. So she punches Shigaraki with her air form, which sends him flying, and then has them all grab missiles before she, like, or first she claps down on them, which, which again, the animation here looks really good. Grabs have uh, has all of the jets firing lasers at her. They condense into a ship that she uses basically as like a spear, and then just stabs Shigaraki with this with this like with this laser um, thing. This like la- this like laser spear thing, as I call it. So she gets a call from somebody at the Pentagon or some other government agency, wherever this dude is from, mentioning about like, oh, this like this stunt will cost you more than your lives, and she's cool with that. And she says that the mi- but he says the missile. Right. As we see this, as we see this panic shot of when Star Trek, which you find what her actual name is, her name is Cassie, uh, when she met all when she met of this photo of her meeting all by as a kid, which was pretty cool. So we find that so that so we see these sh- these. <laughs> These missiles, and the name of these missiles is long as hell. The state of the art hypersonic intercol- intercontinental cruise missiles. <laughs> Y'all really need to shorten the name of that, bro. It's a little too long, bro. And it's called um, a time mat, I think it's what it's called, if I remember correctly. Yeah, time mat, if I'm pronouncing that right. And then the and we end the episode with the and we end the episode off with the missiles coming forward to man. I'm curious what the damage these missiles are gonna be, man. How these missiles work, but. We'll have to wait for next week for that one. So anyway, let's talk about the ED real quick. Now, once again, this ED is absolutely spectacular. Now, apparently, it seems that this ED was actually directed by a woman by the name of uh, Haruka Ida, if I pronounce her name right now. And she seemed to, she also did the EDs for season six. And it looks like she probably did some previous EDs as well for the franchise, man. And... This ED was fantastic once again. I love the almost the very muted color palette they went for the opening of this OP. Almost black and white, but you know, there are some colors coming out there, man. Some really nice shots. Let me get the shot of Mount Fuji, which if you know, you know, man, and I'm excited for that. We get to see a shot of Spinner as he's kind of like went back with during his uh, hermit days when he was just like laying in the computer all day. We have one of Toka when she was a child, and one of what I'm of one of and one of Dobby as well, and Toya, and another shot of Shigaraki as well. I like how all of these were done in like a very muted color. Well, once we switch over to the heroes, they are in like you know a full vibrant you know full color palette. Probably just to simulate the heroes going down the path is good, despite their besides despite their hardships of life, while the Villains, you know, going down the path of evil. I'm assuming that's kind of what she was going with there. We get a shot of Shoji with some girl by a waterfall. I don't know, but I do know that Shoji has a big moment this season, which 
I'm excited to see it because one, I've heard a lot of controversy around the whole thing with Shoji, so I'm excited. So I'm curious to see what the context behind all that, you know, discourse is. But also, as you guys may know, in the dub, he is voiced by Ian Sinclair, who you guys may know also voices uh, eight uh, voices Whis and uh, Dragon Ball Super. He was Dandy in Space Dandy and various other roles. He's also the skeleton dude uh, in One Piece. I forget the dude's name because I don't want to really watch One Piece like that. But he also recently voiced uh, he also recently voiced Anar in Vinland Saga season two's Crunchyroll dub. As you guys know, it's split. Yeah, there's two different dubs for Vinland Saga. One from one from Netflix with LA actors, and one for Funimation slash Sentai Filmworks with Dallas slash Texas based actors. So during the so in the Crunchyroll dub of season two, he's voiced by Ian Sinclair, and that was probably Ian Sinclair's best performance to date, at least in my opinion. Man, there might be another one where someone might uh, agree, dis uh, might uh, disagree with me on that. But at least to me personally, from the shows I've seen him in, man, it's Vinland Saga, no doubt. His performance was incredible in that season, man. Especially during Anor's very emotional moments. Not to get too much into spoilers, man, because you guys need to watch Vinland Saga season two if you guys haven't already, and watch season one of two. Well, watch season one as well, too, of course. But his performance is incredible during season two, man, especially during the big moments that Anar had. So I'm excited to see what he's going to be doing with Shoji. And also, the man has just been dying for Shoji to actually do something in the series, man. And so I know he's excited for when this moment comes up in the season when this comes out. We get another show. Next up, we have Uraraka when she was like a little girl seeing the hero for the first time, yo, dancing and all that, man, being all excited, man. Like, oh my god, kid Uraraka is so cute, man. And you can see Uraraka in the back walking walking behind her, man, holding Izuku's uh, little keychain key he gave her, man, which is nice to see. And then this one was probably one of my favorite ones where we see uh, Kid Todoroki, you know, he's on the ground yeah, obviously in the Todoroki household with flames around, and then the current Todoroki walks up towards him. And then the last shot we get is a, is is a kid, uh, what I'm assuming is supposed to be Kid Izuku and Kid Bakugo with their All Might holographic cards and someone coming up. Someone, and someone else showing up a third card. I don't know who it is but I'm 90% certain it's Bakugo Considering the little bits of what I know of the manga currently, I'm 90% certain that's supposed to be Bakugo's hand uh, that we see there. Which, I'm excited for that, man. I'm excited for Bakugo's big moment, at least I'm assuming. I don't know how much they're going to be adapting from what the manga is currently up in Season 7, but I'm excited nonetheless, man. Because I know there's a lot of crazy shit that's going to be going down this season. And of course, we get the next episode preview. And yeah, man, this was a phenomenal episode, man. Um, spectacular. You know, the, both the LPs and the EDs were once again bangers, man. The songs for both of them was great. I love the visuals of both of them, man. Just incredible work all around, man. It's so good that Hero Walk is finally back, man. And yeah, that's what this video off, guys. Overall, I'm going to give this episode my final, overall, my rating for this episode is going to be a 9.5 out of 10, guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. You like if you did, subscribe if you're new. Follow me, so if you feel like it, links, links down in the description box below. And as always, come back for more. See you guys next time.